Colonel Lewis B. watched the first round of bombing from the deck of his ship. Chesty. Puller had strong doubts. Palalia was the island in front of him. It was a small piece of coral in the Palau group. Even though the Marines were told that the U.S. there were thousands of rounds of ammo all over the place from the Navy, Puller wasn't sure that the Battle of Palalia would be as easy as everyone said it would be. Puller said his goodbyes by going to the ship's bridge. One Navy captain asked him if he could come back for dinner. Puller didn't think as much about a quick win as the naval officer did. One of the worst invasions of Duquan de Cité. You think it's that easy? Why don't you meet me on the beach at five, eat dinner, and buy some souvenirs? He yelled. Puller was right to be worried about the Battle of Peleliu that was coming up. For the Marines, it was one of the worst things they would face in World War II. The Japanese were still a tough enemy in 1944, but they were on the defense. The Japanese were being pushed into central Burma by British and Commonwealth forces, who stopped them at Imphal and Kohima. At the same time, the U.S. had taken over the Marianas, New Britain, Guam, Tinian, and Saipan, as well as the Solomon Islands and Tarawa and the Gilbert Group. Now, the Allies were looking for other places to set up bases so they could back future invasions and eventually take over Japan's home country. The Operation Stalemate General Douglas MacArthur finally persuaded President Franklin D. Roosevelt that the Luzon Late plan to beat the Japanese Empire was the most likely way to succeed. The first reason why Moritai had to be taken was to protect MacArthur's left flank from Japanese air attacks. Taking Palelio and Angar would protect his right wing. Plans were made for an operation called Stalemate. A number of islands in the Palau group caught their attention. The Palaus was a group with many islands that stretched over 100 miles. The biggest was Babeltua, which had an airport but it wasn't used as a goal for long. It turned out that the runway was still being built, so it couldn't be made bigger. The island was also very rough and had a lot of guards. Adding to the trouble, the U.S. Army's 77th Division was supposed to be part of the operation, but had to be sent to Guam instead. The stalemate was broken. A new order called Stalemate II was sent out. Vice Admiral Theodore S. Wilkinson led the Eastern Attack Force, which was made up of the 7th and 96th Divisions of the U.S. Army. It would move on to Ulithi and Yap, which are their new goals. The Western Attack Force, led by Rear Admiral George Fort, would be made up of the 81st Infantry Division, also known as the Wildcats, and the 1st Marine Division. The Wildcats were told to take Angor, and the Marines were told to take Palaliu. The priority was given to Palaliu, one of the farthest southern islands in the line. Palaliu already had an airport that worked, so it was given top priority. A smaller island called Ingasibus, which was joined to Palaliu by a causeway and lay off the north shore, also had an extra fighter airfield. Angor was chosen because it is only seven miles from the southern tip of Palilu and could have airstrips that could handle bigger fighter planes. When the artist arrived on Palilu with the Marines, he saw many horrible things, including Tom Leah's graphic drawing of a badly hurt U.S. soldier. The Life magazine reporter was caught in heavy combat during the attack. He later painted a number of scenes from the battle that were based on his experiences. Palaliu looked like a lobster's claw on a map. It was about 20 square miles in size and surrounded by a fringing reef nearly 1,000 yards wide. The airport was on the southern end, which was mostly flat and open. A thick mangrove swamp was on the eastern edge of the airport. There was a lot of scrub jungle with wild coconuts and occasional grass-grown clearings to the west and south. In the middle of the upper claw, just north of the runway, there was a group of coral ridges covered in thick jungle. They were known as the Umurbrogal Mountains. From the airport, several main roads went along the east and west coasts of this upper claw. 
In the end, they met in the north, in the village of Akalako. In this area, there was a phosphate plant, a radio station, and a hand-operated narrow-gauge railroad. The Japanese built a power plant and a radio direction finder on the lower pincer of the claw. Umer Brogel Mountain was the Marines' main worry. Brigadier General O.P. Smith, deputy commander of the 1st Marine Division, said, There was never any doubt in the minds of the 1st Division planners that the high ground north of the airfield was the most important feature of the island's terrain. The fact that the enemy troops were spread out on Peleliu was a plus for the Leathernecks. A lot of files were taken when Marine and Army units took over Saipan in July. Japan's 31st Army had its base on Saipan. It was common for the enemy to keep very detailed records. They didn't let down the Marines. These papers named the groups that were stationed at Peleliu and the island of Negasibus, which is close by. There were 25,000 enemy troops in the Peleos. The 14th Division, which was one of the best units in the Japanese Imperial Army, was the backbone of the enemy force on Peleliu. One artillery battalion was part of the 2nd Infantry Regiment. The 3rd Battalion, 15th Infantry, had 175mm artillery battalion, an 81mm mortar company, and a 155mm mortar company. There was also a tank unit with 17 tanks and a mix of supporting troops. The complement of troops also included the 53rd Independent Mixed Brigade, one independent infantry company, and the usual naval and construction staff. The army of a general is led by a colonel, a stable and competent, if uninspired, general named Lieutenant General Sadae Inoue was in charge of the 14th Division. Simple instructions were given to him by War Minister Hideki Tojo before he left Tokyo. The islands must be kept until the very end. It was the first spot that stopped the enemy from getting into the Pacific, because they are important air bases. Peleliu and Angar need to be strengthened. Colonel Kumio Nakagawa was in charge of the units on Peleliu, while Inoue's offices were on Koror, which is 25 miles southwest of Peleliu. When he got there in April 1944, he didn't waste any time making the island's defenses stronger. After that, a paper called Palau Group Sector, Training for Victory, was sent to Nakagawa. It was signed by Inoue, but years later it came out that the skilled Colonel Tokechi Tada, who was Inoue's chief of staff, had written it. On Peleliu, more than 10,000 Japanese troops were waiting for the Marines. Major General Kenjiro Murai was also sent to Peleliu by Inoue, which brings up an interesting point. Why did a colonel lead the ground troops when a major general was there? This question wasn't answered until many years later, when Lieutenant Colonel Waite W. Warden, who had been in the Peleliu battle, talked to Inoue while he was in a naval prison on Guam. Marai was sent to Peleliu as insurance because it was seen as an important island and most importantly, to cope with the Navy. Vice Admiral Itu was the Japanese flag officer on Peleliu, and Marai would be on the same level as him. The Army and Navy were at bitter's odds, and Inoue knew that the General's presence would help them get along with Nakagawa. As part of their defenses, the Japanese Army on Peleliu had been digging like moles in the Umar Brogol. They built a monster Swiss cheese out of the natural coral outcroppings that stretched over 5,000 yards from the airstrip to Hill 80 in the northern region. Some were so small that they could only hold one rifleman, while others were so big that they could hold whole battalions. Each cavern was named with a letter and had a special job to do. Most of them were cleverly hidden and had more than one way in or out. Sharp turns and small holes were also cut into the walls of many of the caves to protect the people who lived there from gunfire and the crash of bigger shells. The most important thing about Peleliu was its airport. The airport, which is at the southern tip of the island, could hold big planes that would be very useful in future U.S. attacks on Japanese territory. 
Some of the most complex caves were made by the 214th Naval Construction Battalion in the northern part of Palaliu. A lot of the men in this unit used to work as miners and cave workers before the war. Most of their homes had hospital rooms, electric lights, and air conditioning. The army liked to build their defenses around natural features, but the Japanese Navy built theirs from scratch, free from the cluttering stalactites and stalagmites that were in the army's caves. Over 500 caves were later found, either by blasting or by digging, which was more work. No one will ever know the exact number. Nakagawa had set up four defense areas on the island, each with two battalions. Because it was close to the very important airstrip, he thought that the Marines would land in the southwest part of Peleliu. He put his heavy weapons and huge naval guns here. Light and heavy machine guns and anti-aircraft weapons kept the airport safe. There were hundreds of mines all along the paths that led to the beaches. There were 37 Demers and 75 anemeter anti-tank guns, rifle pits, anti-tank ditches, and strengthened concrete pillboxes all over the island. The firing zones of all the automatic guns were connected to each other. Nakagawa had put a lot of thought into building the island's defenses. He was set on killing all the marines he could. Poor Chesty Puller's 1st Marines. The staff of the 1st Marine Division was also busy while the Japanese were getting ready for the expected attack. After a lot of thought, the first landing would happen in the southwest part of the island with pieces from three regiments landing next to each other. Two troops of Colonel Lewis B would be coming ashore on White 1 and 2. There were 1st Marines under the code name Chesty Puller. This meant that the other company would be kept in regimental reserve. They were told to move past the barracks area, go upstream, turn left, and attack the Umerbergol Mountains nose. The 5th Marines, Lone Wolf, would land on Orange 1 and 2, connect with the 1st Marines on their left, and then go straight ahead toward the eastern shore, in charge of Colonel Harold D. One hour later, Bucky Harris's battalion would get off the plane, move between the other two, and attack across the lower end of the runway. After the Marines took over the airstrip, they would move on to the flat northeastern peninsula and the small islands out to sea, Finally, two companies of the 7th Marines, Mustang, would attack Orange Beach three one after the other. In charge was Colonel Herman H. Hot-Headed Hanneken. The Marines would turn around and charge the enemy at the southern points of land. As a regimental reserve, one unit that has been strengthened would be kept. It was clear that Puller's 1st Marines were the ones who got snubbed. In his book, Chesty, the story of Lieutenant General Lewis B. Puller, USMC, author John Hoffman wrote, The white beaches were framed by a low coral bluff on the left and a small peninsula on the right. Both gave the enemy places to line up and fire deadly enfilade fire down the length of the regiment as it came ashore. Aerial pictures didn't show any defensive structures at either site but the Japanese were known for being very good at hiding their tracks. The danger was enough for senior leaders in the 1st Marines to ask that these sites get extra attention during the pre-landing bombardment. Puller himself asked for it again at the final planning meeting that happened after the tryouts. William Rupertus was too eager to help. Many people in the division had real doubts about how long and hard the Palilu campaign would be but Major General William H. Rupertus, who was in charge of the 1st Marine Division, did not. The balding but dapper boss had been in the Marine Corps for more than 30 years and had been stationed at many different locations. Some people think that Rupertus's bad mood was caused by the tragic deaths of his wife and children from scarlet fever years before. He also didn't get along well with his subordinate soldiers. Some even called him Rupi the Stoop and asked him in private if he was a good boss. Rupertus broke his ankle in an accident right before the attack. 
The leader of the 3rd Marine Amphibious Corps, Major General Roy S. Geiger, was very worried when he heard that Rupertus was hurt and even considered not letting him go on the operation. General O.P. Smith, Brigadier General, stepped in and told Geiger that Rupertus' ankle would heal sufficiently to permit him to carry on. The enemy is hit by Marine gunfire just outside of Palaliu Airfield. The only thing Rupertus did was show disrespect for the U.S. Army men were sent to stalemate too. Even though the U.S., the 81st Division of the Army, had not yet been in battle, but they had trained hard and were in great shape for the upcoming attack. Some of their team spirit came from Major General Paul Mueller, who was their boss and a hero in World War I. Mueller graduated from West Point. Even so, Rupertus wanted Palilu to be run by the Marines alone. Just before D-Day, Rupertus sent out a letter explaining how excited he was about the attack. He thought the operation would be like Tarawa, quick and fierce. He thought Palilu would be taken in four days. It was said that this unrealistic prediction would color tactical thinking ashore for a month to follow. Major Frank Ohau, USMCR, wrote in his book, The Assault on Palaleu, most officers thought this strange paper was meant to be like a pep talk. This wasn't how it affected the news reporters, though. Many of the 36 assigned to, to the division never made it to shore, and only six, one of whom was killed, chose to stay through the early dangerous stages. Because of this, the news about the operation was sketchy, often wrong, and filled with harsh criticism when quick capture didn't happen. Getting ready for the Plelu battle. Many people thought the raggedy-ass Marines of the 1st Division were the best landing unit in the Pacific Theater, even though they had different ideas about how long the war was. They had already done two operations that went well, Guadalcanal and Cape Gloucester. But since the Battle of Gloucester was over, the division was sent to Pavuvu to rest and recover, R&R. A lot of people were upset that the regiment's last R&R was in Australia. The place called Pavuvu in the Russell Islands was called a rain-soaked, rat-infested hunk of real estate. It was a terrible place, and its scenery was nothing like Palaeus. Even though these things were bad, the Leathernecks got by. As new soldiers were brought in and training began, the older veterans taught the newcomers what they knew. As the months went by, confidence rose again. The number of sick patients started to go down, and the unit got a new vibe. Or maybe, as many strongly believed, everyone was just so fed up with Pavuvu that they welcomed the chance to take out their anger on the Japanese, Howe wrote. Another big problem the Marines had was a terrible lack of different kinds of gear. They had a lot less amphibian trucks, flamethrowers, bazookas, browning automatic rifles, bar, and communication gear because the jungle conditions on Guadalcanal and Cape Gloucester were so harsh. These things had to be changed out right away. The 1st Marine Division had never landed on a wide rock that was surrounded by water before. All of their actions took place in the jungle. A lot of training was needed to launch amphibian tractors and DUKWs amphibious trucks, from landing ships and tanks, LSTs at sea, move troops from landing craft to vehicles in deep water, move in waves across the coral, and quickly form the land assault once people got off the boats, Howe wrote. As of now, the section has been getting the newer LVT-A-1, or amphibian tank, to train with, but by the first week of August, the younger LVT-A-4 began to show up. It had a 75 Dimitwas snub nose gun mount instead of the 37 mm mount on the first model. Only about 50 of the almost 900 men in the first amphibious tractor battalion knew how to use a tank. It would be insulting to the intelligence of a military minded reader to say that the battalion was sufficiently trained and indoctrinated to carry out its mission. The commander of the 3rd Armored Amphibian Battalion, Lieutenant Colonel Kimber H. Boyer, wrote, The fact that the first part of the operation went smoothly would normally be seen as a miracle. 
The division was as ready as it could be for the attack, even though the Leathernecks had a lot of setbacks and problems. The part where you trained was over. The men of Nakagawa were ready. The enemy isn't as strong as they seem. So Marines from the 1st Division dig in and wait for orders to move forward, a new plan for the Pacific Theater. At the beginning of September, 30 LSTs steam from Cape Esperance in the Solomon Islands, where the Marines had just finished their last training drill before the Battle of Palaliu. The attack companies and the units that helped them were crammed into the flat-bottomed ships. It was too hot to breathe. Between September 6th and 8th, Vice Admiral Mark Mitcher's aircraft ships of Task Force 38 hit the Palouse. This happened while the Leathernecks were being taken to their destination. It was September 12th, and his military group attacked the Central Philippines. They shot down 173 Japanese planes and killed 305 people on the ground. Commander of the 3rd Fleet, Admiral William F. Bull Halsey was shocked by how few Japanese planes were in the air. He sent a cable to Admiral Chester A. Nimitz, who was in charge of the Central Pacific, asking that the operations in Yap and Palau be canceled so that MacArthur could use the assault troops that were supposed to go on those campaigns in the Philippines. Halsey also said that the attack on the Philippine island of late should be moved from December to October, which is two months earlier. The Joint Chiefs of Staff were at the Octagon Conference in Quebec, Canada, with President Franklin D. Roosevelt when the letter was sent to them. Someone tried to get in touch with MacArthur, but couldn't. However, his Chief of Staff, Lieutenant General R.K. Sutherland, agreed with Halsey's suggestions and was sure that MacArthur would agree with the new schedule. So, the attack on Yap was called off, and the operation on late was now set for October 20th. MacArthur's Southwest Pacific Army took the Eastern Attack Force to Manus Island, where it joined it. The Western Attack Force, on the other hand, was still supposed to take Palaliu, Ulithi, and Angar. In order to protect the right wing, Nimitz left that part out of the message he sent to the Joint Chiefs. The forces of invasion were already at sea, he said. And the promise already made to phase, I meant that the invasion could not be called off. Oldendorf has no more targets at first. The plan only called for ship gunfire to hit Palaliu for two days before the landing. It was changed, and the Marines were given an extra day. As many strong points as possible were to be destroyed, along with any enemy planes on the ground and artillery installations. Because the other islands were close by and could provide more troops to help Nakagawa's garrison, naval shooting was meant to destroy any barges, sampans, or ships that could do this. A huge barrage of 16-inch, 14-inch, and 5-inch bombs were fired at Palaliu by Rear Admiral Jesse Oldendorf's heavy strike force, which was made up of four battleships and many cruisers and destroyers. Most of the buildings above ground were destroyed by this salvo. These included the barracks, hangars, utility and office buildings, and more. But Oldendorf didn't know that his bombardment, while awesome, didn't have much of an effect on the underground defenses. On the radio, Oldendorf said he had run out of targets, which shocked Rupertus and Lieutenant Colonel Lewis J. Fields, who was in charge of operations for the division, the people who worked for the section wrote that they were shocked. His name is Lieutenant Colonel F. A. Ramsey. Junior, not only did it come as a surprise, but none of us understood it, given the study and requirements we had given, as well as the plans we had worked so hard on and agreed were necessary. The Marines had to be happy with the three days the Navy gave them, even though they didn't agree with the pre-invasion bombing. It was up to the troops to do the rest. The terrible blows from Paleliu didn't bother Nakagawa's men at all. As the invasion troops got closer to the island, people were more determined than ever. The enemy has planned to land, one Japanese soldier wrote in a diary that was found after the fight. Let them come if they plan to. Who is scared of the British or the Americans? We are going to protect Paleliu. 
In the dense jungle of Peleliu, Marines throw Molotov cocktails at enemy posts along Suicide Ridge, a heavily contested hill. This is one of many close quarters battles that happen there. When arms, legs, heads, guts, and brains went flying, when dawn broke on September 15th, the Japanese defenders of Peleliu could clearly see the shapes of hundreds of U.S. ships far out to sea. The Marines were at least able to launch their attack on a placid sea because it was a clear, calm morning. The Underwater Demolition Teams, UDT, did a great job of cleaning up the areas near the beaches and checking out the reef. The islands were in the range of naval guns which fired round after round into the land. Carrier planes flew over the landing sites just before 8 a.m. to get rid of any gun positions. The line of departure for the LVTs carrying the first waves of troops was about 4,000 yards out to sea. The third Armored Amphibian Battalion's amphibian tanks went ahead of the LVTs to cover them with fire. In addition, 18 Landing Craft Infantry LCI ships shot 4.5-inch rockets to help. As the heavier guns on the ships out at sea started walking their shells on shore, more fighter bombers from the U.S. Navy dropped their bombs on the beach. All of this artillery made it hard for Peleliu to see. Nothing could live through that, said a Marine officer. It turned out that what he said was wrong. As the smoke and dust cleared, Lieutenant Colonel H.C. Churgi sat in a bus and watched the fireworks show. As the landing boats hit the beach, they were hit by Japanese artillery and mortar fire, which made everyone very angry. He later said, I had never seen combat before, and the first thing that struck me was how badly $40,000 worth of gear was being used. The Marines were indeed under heavy fire as they rushed ashore. As the infantrymen moved inland, it got harder for the enemy to fight back. The Sherman medium tanks of Company A, 1st Tank Battalion, were hit by enemy guns that were hidden during the fourth wave. One of the 18 tanks made it to land without any damage. By the end of the day, only five Shermans were still in use. As the people got off the planes and onto the beaches, they could hear the ping of bullets hitting the Amtraks. Some of the track trucks were hit right in the face. Arms, legs, heads, guts, and brains went flying. PFC. Charles Doolittle from the 5th Marines. PFC wrote that Peleliu was a nightmare of flashes, violent explosions, and snapping bullets. Soldier Eugene B. Sledge was in Company K, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. He was a bazooka man. Puller's men had the hardest time on the white beaches right from the start. Japanese shells killed and damaged a lot of the First Marines' electronics and the people who worked on them. It would be later in the day before Puller's command post, CP, and the division could talk on the radio. Getting to the point on White 2, on the 2nd Battalion, First Marines pushed inland against moderate resistance. The 3rd Battalion, on the other hand, came under heavy fire from Japanese mortars and guns. Company K, led by Captain George P. Hunt, took the most damage. His 225-person unit was given the unpleasant job of protecting a point called the Point. Two Marines crouch down and slowly make their way toward a Japanese base. In the book Coral Comes High, which Hunt wrote after the war, he wrote about the Point. It rose 30 feet above the water's edge. The coral was solid and jagged, with sharp peaks, deep cracks, and huge rocks. Pillboxes made of steel and concrete had been dug or shot into the bottom of the drop that went straight down to the beach. Others were built on top, with six feet of coral and concrete piled on top, and spider holes were blasted around them to protect the troops. It was much better than anything we had imagined when we looked at the overhead photos. The Marines from Hunt fought against the point for almost two hours. So why it was necessary to take this enclave to stop the terrible fire that was falling on the riflemen who were still coming aboard. Lieutenant William A. Willis threw a smoke grenade near a hole that had a 47 observer gun in it. At the same time, Corporal Robert Anderson shot a number of rifle grenades from his M1. The second one went off, setting off the ammo stored in the enclosure on fire. Soldiers yelling from the pillbox were quickly cut down as they ran out. 
The point was safe with Hunt's men. But it didn't come cheap. Hunt's second platoon was now alone, and he didn't know how many people were hurt there. He didn't spend any time setting up a perimeter with the pieces of his first and third platoons. He only had 32 Marines with him. Fill in the blanks. When the commander of the 3rd Battalion, 1st Marines, Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Sabol, saw that Company K was stuck on top of the point, he quickly sent Company L to plug the gap between Hunt and Company 1. However, Japanese gunners kept the pressure on, and the reinforcements couldn't get to Company K, leaving Hunt's men stuck and on their own. The 5th Marines had a better time in the middle, where they only ran into scattered enemy lines. Harris's Leathernecks drove into the heart of Paliliu and reached their first goal by mid-morning. One small mistake did happen. Parts of the 7th Marines went ashore on Orange 2 instead of Orange 3, which slowed down the progress of Company K, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. The mistake was fixed quickly, and the momentum was quickly gained back. The Orange 1 squad led by Corporal Louis K. Bausel moved slowly forward to destroy Japanese defensive posts in dense brush. Fanatical enemy troops ran out with grenades, killing themselves and hurting Marines nearby. From a hole in the wall, one man threw a grenade that hit Bausel and a group of other riflemen. He threw himself on the device right away. By some miracle, Bausel lived through the blast but he later died from his injuries. Marines who fought in the Battle of Palaleu were given eight medals of honor. His was the first one given to him. During the fight between the 1st and 5th Marines, the 7th Marines ran into many natural and man-made hurdles on the beach. The Amtraks were sent to the left because of these obstacles, which caused misunderstanding that took time to clear up. A huge anti-tank ditch was used as a CP and gave the advancing troops cover. The beaches of Palaleu were full of broken bodies, abandoned tools, and cars that were on fire. Tom Leah, an artist and reporter for Life magazine, saw a hurt Marine stumble toward the beach. Later he wrote, his face was half bloody pulp, and the in pieces what was left of an arm hung down like a stick. The 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines, had gained about 500 yards by late morning, they quickly ran into trouble, though, when enemy pillboxes and blockhouses formed a base near the barracks area. The Sherman tanks clanking let everyone know they were there, but they started helping the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, when they were supposed to be helping the enemy. Soon, there was a space between the two units, which didn't close until later that afternoon. By late afternoon, you could see dust from moving cars off in the distance. Snip tanks, one Marine yelled. He had a point. Thirteen light Japanese tanks were moving toward where the 1st and 5th Marines were stationed. Snipers rode on top of the armored trucks, and regular soldiers came up behind them. With 75 millium of howitzers, 37 or Tadarby guns, bazookas, and heavy machine guns, the Marines attacked with everything they had. Two Japanese tanks did get through the barrier, but were quickly destroyed because they were already on fire. During the fight for Peleliu, this was the only big, well-planned attack. The enemy stayed hidden the whole time of the fight. Major General Roy S. Geiger left, who was in charge of the, the three Marine Amphibious Corps, and Major General William H. Rupertus, right, who was in charge of the 1st Marine Division, look at a map very carefully while planning activities. As night fell, nothing happened because the expected Banzai attack never happened. Along the lines, there were small breaches and invasions. Lieutenant Colonel Austin Schaffner was hurt in a grenade attack, and Lieutenant Colonel Louis W. Walt took over as commanding officer of the 5th Marines. Walt crawled out past the 5th Marines' lines with only a runner by his side. He found each unit and brought some order to the edges. The Navy Cross was given to him for this great feat. It had been a bad day for the 1st Marine Division, Richard Wheeler wrote in his book, A Special Valor, The U.S. Marines in the Pacific War. There were 1,111 deaths, injuries, and people who went missing. There were also many cases of battle fatigue and being too hot to move. Not only were there a lot of deaths, 
but the beachhead only covered about half of the southern part of the island. General Rupertus had planned to take the whole area by nightfall, so this made him nervous. It made him feel bad that he had said the campaign would be short. It was only the first day. The Japanese on Peleliu used a new method that would become the standard for future actions in the Pacific that would involve both land and sea. The Leathernecks kept an eye out for a drop in confidence, but there was none. The troops led by Nakagawa were the best Japan had to give, and they would not make many mistakes during the battle. God damn it, Louis. You need to kick ass to make things happen. The artillery from the 11th Marines started moving their guns to help the troops by the next day, D plus one. Coming ashore just before 10 a.m., General Rupertus went to the Division CP that Smith had set up the day before in the anti-tank ditch on Orange 2. He was angry that the 1st Marines weren't moving, so he put pressure on Puller. God damn it, Louie, you need to kick ass to get things done, he yelled. In the end, Rupertus would lose everything because of the stress of the Peleliu battle. Near the end of the battle, he told a staff officer, this thing has almost got me beat. He would go back to the United States and die of heart failure in March 1945. Even though Rupertus said some mean things about the 1st Marines, they were still pushing into some of the worst conditions the war had ever seen. The best way to explain it is in the 1st Marines regimental narrative. Along its center, the rocky spine was heaved up in a twisted mass of decayed coral strewn with rubble, crags, ridges, and gulches thrown together in a confusing maze. The men could not dig in. The best they could do was pile some coral or wood around their places. The sharp rock cut their shoes and clothes, and every time they hit the deck to get away, it tore their bodies. Each blast threw pieces of coral into the air, which made the effect of each shell's breakup many times stronger. The enemy dug into this like ants, and they stayed there to fight to the death. The men of Hunt, who were on top of the point, held out. They fought off many attacks by angry Japanese people. In some places, there were four layers of dead enemy soldiers. The Marines who were stuck were finally found after 30 scary hours. Only 78 of the 235 riflemen who first landed made it back to base. The Leathernecks of Puller kept attacking. As the days went by, companies were broken up into platoons, which were led by corporals. The Marines quickly gave the place the name Bloody Nose Ridge. The fighting in the Murbergal was very harsh. Captain Everett C. Pope was in charge of Company C, 1st Battalion, 1st Marines, and they were fighting in an area known as Waltz Ridge. Their men fought off many enemy attacks all night and into the next day. The assault on Peleliu, James H. Hallis wrote, As the fighting turned physical, the Marines threw some of their attackers over the steep cliffs. A sergeant saw two enemy soldiers climbing up the slope to his position and threw an empty grenade box at them. He then opened fire with his rifle. Japanese bombs were picked up and thrown back by Private First Class Philip Collins, of Gardner, Massachusetts, before they went off. Pope said he did that until one blew up in his hand. After that, he picked up a rifle and used it until he was too weak to load it. They were no longer fire eaters. Soldier Arthur Jackson. Geiger knew on September 21st that the 1st Marines were no longer a fighting unit. They weren't fire eaters anymore, one cop said. One regimental combat team from the 81st Division was told to land by Gregor. Surprisingly, Rupertus didn't agree. He said that his Marines could finish the job if they had another day or two, but Geiger didn't agree, so he radioed General Miller. The 321st RCT was sent to Peleliu to help the 1st Marines, who were in a lot of trouble. The other groups on the island did better, but more people were hurt. The 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines, and the 1st and 3rd Companies of the 5th Marines were ready to take the airstrip. As the ranks pushed forward, bullets snapped and cracked, like some unreal thunderstorm. 
This was because Japanese gunners were focusing on the ridges and could look down their throats. As the infantry walked across the airport, the sound of people who were hurt or dying was scary. Cries for corpsmen went mostly unanswered, Hallis wrote. Many of the Marines who were badly hurt died on the hot coral runways before anyone could help them. Even though there was a heavy attack, the Leathernecks held onto the strip. Over the next few days, they moved northeast to get Peleu's lower pincer. The RDF was destroyed, and two islands, Nabad and Island A, were cleaned up in the ocean. The 5th Marines had made a road all the way to the water by September 23rd. They called it Purple Beach. They turned this into a rest place if you could find one on Peleliu. In the evenings of September 23rd and 24, General Inoue tried to help Nakagawa's troops from Babalthuap. Even though naval ships and guns had a huge amount of firepower, about 600 enemy soldiers did make it to shore. It's likely that they were killed in the fight as they disappeared into Peleliu's complex network of caves. On September 28th, the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, attacked Gesibus Island in the north by land and sea. Before the landing, artillery fired, and fighters from VMF 114 used Vought F4U Corsairs to bombard the beaches. Company K pushed to the north while Company L took over the eastern part of the island. By the next afternoon, the Marines had taken Ngesibus. In the south, the 7th Marines moved forward even though the enemy fought back hard. Company I, 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines, ran right into three concrete gun sites that could be used for different things. Nothing could move this position, and finally, combat engineers laid charges to destroy the building while being covered by smoke grenades. PFC was the person who did the most to help destroy enemy bases in the southern area. This is Arthur Jackson from the 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines. The big Alaskan bar soldier, 19, kept the Japanese fighters pinned down while he threw white phosphorus grenades and satchel charges into the holes and took out position after position. He took out 12 bunkers and killed 50 enemy forces altogether. Because he was so brave, he was given the Medal of Honor and then promoted to second lieutenant. A tough battle for the Umarbrugal pocket. The 7th Marines got rid of most of the enemy in the southern part of the island in three days. At 1520, Hanneken sent a word to the division headquarters that said, oh, one was taken. The Marines' seventh mission on Peleliu is now over. The 5th and 7th Marines were lucky that their break only lasted a short time. After the 1st Marines, who were tired of fighting, left, Rupertus told all the fit riflemen to join the frantic fight for the Umur Brogel. The tired infantrymen stuck in the hilly spine of Peleliu had to wait for a long time. Gunfire from the Navy didn't work against the Coral Bastion, and 75 Mito Powitzers had to be pushed up some of the cliffs to help the troops. A lot of napalm was dropped by Corsairs in the Umur Brogel during what were likely some of the fastest bombing runs of the war. The gasoline and jelly mix, which was new in the Pacific War, wiped out all the plants on the hills. Everyone could now see how ugly the Umar Brogol was. The Marines were led by Colonel Lewis B. after getting rid of the Japanese defenses and destroying two of their light tanks. Chesty Puller moved along a ridge on Peleliu. Every Marine fighting in those hills is an expert, said Major Gordon Gale of the 5th Marine Battalion. He wouldn't. The Marines on Peleliu were no longer fighting by the middle of October. They stumbled along the shore with only their guns on their backs, waiting to be taken to the ships that were waiting. Many of them just stared, but some broke down and cried. They had lived through hell, but thousands of their fellow Marines had not. Soon, Muller's wildcats showed up on the island and took over from the leathernecks, but the fighting was still going on. 